And welcome back to the Grateful Ducks podcast after a long hiatus in the offseason. It felt like quite a while for me personally. Uh, we are back for season two of the Grateful Ducks podcast. Uh, last time we joined you to end season one, we had Roger Sherman on discussing his college football road trip. And then that led into some downtime in the offseason. But we will be back regularly now from here on out. Uh, just a little bit of what to expect for uh, these this season, some upcoming episodes. We're going to start off previewing conference by conference, having conference preview shows. We will be discussing EA Sports College football uh, with some regular segments there, as I have obviously purchased the game and playing it regularly. I'll go through my personal gameplay experience, maybe some suggestions and advice for other people when they're playing the games. Uh, but we won't be doing that today. That will be in future episodes. And we'll have some regular Ducks talk, uh, talking Oregon football, as the name would give you that uh, hint with Grateful Ducks. We will be talking uh, Oregon heavy at some points during episodes. Uh, but we won't be doing that today. Today we will be doing a SEC season preview. Uh, you could expect all the conferences. Yeah, all of the football bowl subdivision conferences. Uh, we'll do a conference by conference preview and slowly roll those out as we get closer to kickoff in week zero and week one. Then we'll probably have a regular weekly show. Some of them will be live. Others will have uh, guests with the guests. We typically will try to have those. I'll have those as live episodes. Other times, like today, this will just be recorded. You'll go back and watch it whenever you want. Uh, with all of that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get down to business here with our first season preview. So we start with the SEC, and it's the new look 16 team SEC. And there you have it with the updated pinwheel logo now you, you can see texas and oklahoma officially are members of the sec so let's get down to it let's see where we're at and i'll show you how this is going to work so what i had done is i've broken this down into two different segments here so what you're going to see is the first half of this episode we're going to be talking about what I feel are the realistic SEC title game contenders. Not necessarily championship contenders, but teams that I feel could make it to the SEC championship game. Uh, that Some of those teams may have a better shot than others to win the SEC championship, but we're going to talk about all the teams that I feel are championship contenders. In the second half of the episode, We'll talk about the best of the rest. Maybe teams that could be a surprise, teams that might give other teams in the conference a headache throughout the season. Uh, so we will start with, as expected, the what should be everybody's preseason number one ranked team in the entire country, the Georgia Bulldogs. The Georgia Bulldogs return several starters on both sides of the ball uh they have what i think will be the number one quarterback in this year's draft carson beck returning as well carson beck is one of the favorites to win the heisman this year as george's quarterback uh the running back room is very deep they got trevor etn the brother of travis etn over from Florida. He transferred out of Florida to Georgia in the transfer portal this year. He's projected to be their starting running back. He was a thousand yard rusher last year at Florida. Um, they lose a lot at wide receiver. So they lost first round draft picks, Brock Bowers. They lost Lad McConkey, who was, I believe, a second round pick in the draft. Uh, so the question mark for the Georgia offense will be the wide receivers. Now, they will still have some depth there and some strength as it is Georgia, and they are just reloading at wide receiver. But the inexperience, especially early on, will most likely show up in the wide receiver room. 
but they have one of the best quarterbacks in the country with Carson Beck to back them up and support them. And their offensive line is reloaded. They returned four starters on offense. So this is hands down the favorite uh, in the SEC this year to win the SEC championship game. Um, they'll have a lot of tests on the way, along the way. Uh, moving on to the defense, they also returned seven starters on defense to go with that offense. You can never doubt Kirby Smart and his staff. Uh, they have one of the best defensive coordinators in the entire country, Greg Schumann, a young up-and-coming defensive coordinator who in this next cycle I would think would be a head coaching candidate on the top of a lot of teams' list to take over, and he's been doing a great job there at Georgia with the defense. Uh, let's take a look at their schedule here. On the right-hand side, they have a tough challenge. Opening week, uh, neutral site in Atlanta, neutral against Clemson. Uh, they will be favored in that game, most likely. And as you go down the stretch there, uh, the next challenge really will be week four at Alabama. So going on the road to Alabama, uh, still have some challenges on the schedule as you go along the road. Then you got to go to Texas. Uh, also, the neutral site with Florida and Georgia, the world's largest outdoor cocktail party game. Uh, and then for, from there, they have to go to Ole Miss. We'll talk about Ole Miss coming up. Uh, and then the big game against Tennessee. And then they end the year with uh, two what I would think would be softballs with UMass and Georgia Tech. But it's not really a given that this Georgia team is going to run the table. We have to see how things shake out. They're going to be dominant. They will be the preseason number one ranked team in the entire country. Um, I still personally think the other team that could be getting some first place votes would be Ohio State. But we'll talk about Ohio State in the Big Ten preview in the Big Ten episode. Uh, so this is hands down the conference favorite. Uh, but as you know, in the SEC, there's no easy game or easy win in, on the schedule. I don't anticipate this team to go undefeated. They may have one loss somewhere in there. I don't know which one it could be, but road games in the SEC, man. You got to go to Alabama. You've got to go to Texas now. Um, you have to go to Ole Miss. There's going to be some challenges along the way, and we're not even talking about the opener against Clemson, which I think they will win, but Clemson's going to be a very good program right off the bat. They're not really trying to do a whole lot there. I mean, you got Texas Tech in week two. They got UMass in that softball layup in the penultimate week, uh, but they're going to have some challenges. Moving on, speaking of Texas, the college semifinal, college football playoff semifinalists from last year, they return a whole lot on both sides of the ball. Obviously, you have Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning at quarterback, the best quarterback duo in the country. Arch Manning has been, from all reports, doing a phenomenal job as a backup quarterback and understanding his role and what he needs to do moving forward. Um, the challenge again for this team is the wide receiver and the running back room. They lost a lot to the draft. They will be reloading at both of these positions. So that could be some weaknesses for them there. And they again have a very challenging schedule. So again, you look at the schedule here, Week one, Colorado State, they should have no problem there. Week two, the big game in the big house. I anticipate that they will be short favorites there, uh, but you're going on the road to the big house in week two. You're getting a test right off the bat. And then you have a little bit of a softball for three weeks until you get to the Red River rivalry game there against Oklahoma in Dallas. Uh, Last year on a last second play, Texas got beat by Oklahoma. I'm sure that's in the back of their minds. They're going to be coming out ready to play. And now that is a big game with SEC implic implications there. And then after that, you go right into play Georgia at home. So you have Oklahoma and Georgia back-to-back -back weeks. Um, 
And then you have Vanderbilt. That's a layup. And then another tough one, Florida, I think, is going to be a very improved team. And we'll talk about Florida down the road here. But I think that's not as easy of a game as people will think. I mean, it's going to be in Texas, so that should be favorable. But I think Florida is going to be a very improved program this year in year three. And then you have the, if you jump down to the final game of the season against Texas A&M, the rivalry there, the in-state rivalry is renewed as a SEC rival now. Uh, so I'm not going to say that Texas is going to win the SEC in year one. I'm not even sure that they are going to make it to the championship game. They're easily a contender uh, to make the title game. But that schedule is a gauntlet. I mean, you have some down weeks in there where you could rest some of your guys in the second half of games and kind of look into the next week and the week after that. It's going to be very, very challenging as a team, year one team in the SEC to compete. Now, what you are seeing on the schedule, some they did get some favors there. They don't have to face Ole Miss. Uh, they don't face LSU. You don't see, they don't see Mizzou. Uh, you don't see Tennessee on the schedule or they don't have Alabama. So as challenging as, as this schedule is, worst case scenario, as long as they win all the games in front of them against some of the softer teams in the conference, you know, you have the challenge against Michigan, Oklahoma, Georgia. So I would say three losses maximum even with being a year one team in the SEC. Uh, we'll see how things go. It's going to be tough. New team, new conference. How well do you handle the travel? How well do you handle the SEC style of play? They have a lot of experience from playing in the college football playoff last year. Coach Sark will have these guys improved. Uh, they also lose their co-defensive coordinator in Jeff Choate, who left to take the head coaching job at Nevada. So the linebacking core, which he was in charge of, uh, will be under a new helm, a new regime as well. Uh, so we're going to have to see how the defense responds there. Moving on to the lane train, baby. Ole Miss, the running Rebels. This is a team that I'm very excited for uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, Lane Kiffin is one of the most entertaining coaches in the entire country. Does a great interview. He's uh, very entertaining on uh, social media accounts. Uh, he does a great job with his players. He's a very, very good coach. Uh, he's never played in the SEC title game with Ole Miss. Uh, it's very possible that this could be the year for Ole Miss to make it to the SEC championship game. Uh, very favorable schedule. Uh, late. Lane Kiffin, once again, he's known as the Portal King. Uh, got a lot of guys through the transfer portal. Most notably, I feel like his biggest acquisition was Walter Nolan, the big, bad D tackle from Texas A&M, who will be joining the defense right up front with a lot of starting experience and knows all these SEC teams, SEC teams very well. Um, if you include the transfers with starting experience, this Ole Miss team returns 10 offensive starters and 10 defensive starters. So 20 out of the 22 starters that are projected for this team have starting experience from previous years. That's huge. This is a big advantage for Ole Miss. Not many teams in the entire country have that much starting experience returning and I really do expect Ole Miss to make a very legitimate run into the SEC championship game and I think very, very likely make the college football playoff. Um, breaking down their schedule a little bit more, um, October 12th at LSU under the lights there. Uh, that's going to be a challenge. That's a very, very difficult game uh, as an away team at I don't know how they get through that game safely. Uh, the home team is 10-2 and two in the last 12 games in that series. So they're going to have their backs up against the wall there. But also, if you look um, at the rest of their schedule, very favorable 
favorable. Uh, their first SEC game, they open up against Kentucky, then South Carolina before that. Oklahoma, first year in the SEC. But if you notice, they don't face Texas. They don't face Alabama this year. They don't face Tennessee. So between that stretch of LSU, Oklahoma, Georgia, and Florida in the back half of their schedule, we are going to learn what type of team Ole Miss is. You won't need to see a lot from Ole Miss in that first half of the schedule. They won't need to show much on offense. They won't need to show a lot on defense. They could kind of essentially walk through the first half of their schedule and then be ready to bring it, be healthy, ready to go in that second half. Uh, very motivated team. They know they have a favorable schedule. They have. They know the expectations that are on them as they're going. Moving on. Roll Tide. We all know about Alabama and the storyline there with Nick Saban retiring, greatest coach in the history of college football. Kalen DeBoer comes in, played in the national championship game with Washington, um, loses his offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, who originally signed on with him, but then left to take the job with the Seattle Seahawks as their offensive coordinator. So he's got a new OC. Um, Jalen Milrow is back. He is expected to be another Heisman Trophy contender. The question that I have and I'm curious to see is how Milrow will handle Kalen DeBoer's style of offense. Um, because he has Ty Simpson as his backup and Ty Simpson has some experience. He would be ready to go in, I think, if Jalen Milrow would struggle. But with the experience that Milrow gained last year and having gotten benched, and then after he got benched and coming back and looking light years better after that, he kind of figured things out. Now he has to relearn a lot of different things under Kalen DeBoer, and that's never an easy task. So Alabama could have some challenges here in year one with Kalen DeBoer. Uh, the defense also lost a lot of starters to the draft, and I think it might be a little bit of a different defense than what we're used to because obviously Nick Saban is no longer there. Uh, Washington, their defense was not their strength in previous years. Um, you won't see your typical Alabama D-line where there's a dominant D-tackle or an edge rusher up front. They're going to have to piece some things together there as well. Um the schedule is not too bad starting out. I like that they scheduled uh, a Big Ten opponent and they go to Wisconsin in week three. I expect them to be favored there in week three, but Camp Randall's uh, no easy place to play. So we will see how things go there. Then they go, then they get the bye week as they prepare for Georgia. So they will have two weeks to prepare for the Georgia game. Uh, that's when we will really see how this new Alabama team can handle things in the SEC under Kalen DeBoer. Because uh, they did get, they suffered from the transfer portal a little bit. Um, the Kalen DeBoer offense is going to look the same, but it will look different. By that, I mean, you don't have three NFL draft pick wide receivers with Roma Dunze and Jalen Polk and uh, who I'm blanking on the third receiver's name from Washington, but they had three. NFL draft picks, and you're not really going to see that as a strength uh, this year for Alabama. You might see Milrow running the ball a lot more uh, as an option. Uh, might utilize the running back room a little bit more as that could have a little bit of depth there. Uh, but if you look in that second half of the schedule, let's focus on that because obviously you got the challenge with Georgia – I expect that to be a loss. I expect that to be their first loss of the year. So they open up at three and one. Uh, then they go to Tennessee and Neyland Stadium. That will be a real challenge. Last time there, two years ago, uh, on the third weekend in October, uh, Tennessee beat Alabama, as everybody can remember from that experience from two years ago. So they're trying to avenge that loss. Neyland Stadium is one of the most challenging places to play in the country. And I expect Alabama to have a hard time with that. And I think Tennessee could pull off that win. But then after that, they got Mizzou at home. 
Okay, and then they got their second bye, and then they have LSU. So that three week, four week stretch where they have three weeks, three games in four weeks against Tennessee, Mizzou, and LSU. That's what we will really find out. Is this a SEC title game contender, or are they just going to be playing for a bowl game? Or are they going to be another team that makes the playoff as a at large bid? Um they're going to have to win two out of those three games if they want to make the playoff there. And then you have end of the year with Oklahoma and then Auburn. Uh, the Iron Bowl to end the season will, is always a challenging game. We'll see how Kalen DeBoer handles that rivalry, rivalry game at the end of the season in the SEC. That's at home in Tuscaloosa. So I put uh, Ole Miss slightly ahead of Alabama in my preseason thoughts here uh, because of the experience and the depth that Ole Miss returns. And there's a lot of new factors here. First year head coach, new offensive coordinator, um, tough schedule. It's going to be very difficult to see that same Alabama team we've been used to for the last decade and a half under Kalen DeBoer in year one. He might turn things around and make Alabama that powerhouse that everybody expects. I just don't expect it in year one to be a team that's playing in the sec championship game, but you can never ever count Alabama out as we've all learned. Next up a very hot team, sexy pick for not just a sec championship game, uh, but also for the college football playoff. And some people say that they could win the national championship game this year. I'm not one of those people that thinks that they could win the national championship but they do have a lot. They return Brady Cook uh, at quarterback. They return the number one receiver in the country, Luther Burden, as you see here pictured. Uh, he will be the Bolitnikoff favorite to, as the award for the number one wide receiver in the country. He said at SEC Media Day, one of his goals is to win the Heisman Trophy. So you could put him up as one of the best candidates that is not a quarterback for that position. Uh, very favorable schedule. If you look here, they don't face Georgia. They don't face Texas. They don't face LSU. They don't face Ole Miss. And if you look even deeper, they play six teams on this schedule with a first year head coach. Six teams on this schedule are having a head coach in year one. I always kind of look at that and favor the team with the more experienced coach. I mean, year one could always be a struggle for a lot of teams when they're get the new head coach in there. They get hit hard by the transfer portal in the era there. They get a late start to recruiting because they're usually a later hire, sometimes December, January. In Alabama's case, Caleb DeBoer did not get hired until um, almost February. So he got a really late start at Alabama. Um, they add in a new defensive coordinator. Their former defensive coordinator left to take the job at LSU as defensive coordinator. We'll key in on him in the LSU portion here coming up. Uh, they bring in Corey Batoon from South Alabama. His defenses have always been some of the best in the country, but you may not hear about, may not have heard so much about him because he was not a Power Five coach. I expect their defense to maintain the strength that they had last year, but not necessarily improve in the year one under a new DC. Uh, but again, going back to that schedule, you're looking at six and zero oh, going into a home game against Auburn. They could potentially be then seven and zero oh, facing Alabama. And then from there you have Oklahoma at home. And then the back three games of their schedule are games that they are going to be favored in. I could see why some people think that this could be a team that goes undefeated in the regular season. Uh, Alabama on the road is going to be a dogfight. Texas A&M on the road is going to be a dogfight. But I understand why there's a lot of hype behind this team. I understand why people believe that they could go 12-0. and But you're in the SEC. Those road games against Texas A&M and Alabama are no joke. Auburn's going to be ready to play. Uh, Oklahoma will put up a fight. I mean, two losses maximum here. 
definitely a playoff team. Uh, I still think Ole Miss is a little bit better than them just as far as making the SEC championship game. But I think Ole Miss and Mizzou are both teams that you should be looking at as making the college football playoff if they do not win the SEC championship game as at-large bids. Moving on to our next contender, one of my personal favorite teams, uh, the Tennessee Volunteers, Rocky Top. Um, one of the toughest places to play in the entire country. If you look at what uh, Josh Heupel has done everywhere he's gone, he's developed programs and built programs into winners. Uh, last year, a little bit of a down year with Joe Milton taking over for Hendon Hooker after the big year from Hendon Hooker. Uh, really pay attention to the quarterback play this year. They have the five-star recruit quarterback that they are saying is the best quarterback that Tennessee has had in Knoxville since Peyton Manning, a guy by the name of Nico Ayamalavia. So Nico I, but just know that he's Nico. Everybody in the country will know him as Nico. The guy's a playmaker. He balled out against Iowa's defense in the bowl game this past January. Uh, still as a redshirt freshman this year, it's going to be challenging to be contending in the SEC as a redshirt freshman. He's a guy that could do it. He's a gamer. He's a five-star recruit for a reason. I just think it takes a little bit more time to develop and be a successful quarterback in the SEC. You have some instances of a redshirt freshman that comes in and is lights out after sitting out that freshman year. Uh, I don't really believe that you're going to see too many true freshmen moving forward in college football. I think a lot of Schools are kind of getting their true freshman in as a redshirt to develop and understand the offense. Uh, Nico's the guy of the future here. But the defense, this defense is high power. They've got big, bad James Pierce Jr. on the D-line, leading one of the best D-lines in the country. I think James Pierce is a top five pick in the NFL draft. And depending on how the NFL season shakes out, he could go number one overall. He could break this quarterback streak and be somebody that ends up being the number one overall pick in the draft in 2025. The guy is that good. He's that dominant. He's the high, He's the best defensive player available in the draft. Uh, the secondary should also be strong. Looking at the schedule, no Texas, no Ole Miss. Uh, still have those challenges in there. They get Alabama at home. Uh, they have to go on the road to Oklahoma. They get Florida at home on October 12th. Uh, again, SEC championship game contender. Uh, outside looking in on the playoffs, I think. It all depends on the quarterback play. The defense is going to be right there uh, with that front seven, giving the SEC teams a fit, fits everywhere they go. Uh, Georgia is going to be a battle as always. So we will see how things shake out for Tennessee preseason ranked top 25 team. I don't know about top 10. I probably have them in the 12 to 15 range for uh, myself personally. Uh, LSU. This is an interesting one uh, for me. I put them in the contenders list mainly because it is LSU because they are always an SEC championship game contender. Now, that being said, they have a lot of inexperience on offense. They lost Heisman Trophy quarterback Jaden Daniels, who put up one of the single greatest seasons in college football history last year. Uh, they lose two first-round wide receivers to the draft. Uh they bring in Garrett Nussmeyer from who was the backup last year. And he's got a little bit of inexperience. You're not going to see the same style of offense that you saw with Jaden Daniels because he's not that mobile quarterback like Jaden. Uh, you're going to see a pass heavy offense from LSU. Uh, not as much depth in the running back room, but they will, they always find ways. 
But the difference is Jaden Daniels was their leading rusher last year. So that will be interesting. Uh, new defensive coordinator because the the eyesore at LSU the last year or two has been their defense. Betting LSU overs with how strong their offense was last year and how terrible their defense was, was free money. Mortgage money for it, if you will. Uh, they bring in a new defensive coordinator, Blake Baker from Mizzou, who we were talking about previously. He left Mizzou. is Mizzou's defensive coordinator. LSU threw the bag at him. They said, how much you want? And they made him the highest paid defensive coordinator in the country. That's how highly respected Blake Baker is as a defensive coordinator. Will he be able to make all the changes and adjustments that he needs to in year one? I don't think so, but he definitely will trend upwards every year moving forward for them. Um, looking at the schedule, again, they get Ole Miss at home on October 12th. That'll be a big game. But we can't look too far ahead because we have to go to that opener in Vegas, Labor Day weekend against USC. Um, two teams losing a lot on offense and two new defenses as USC hired a new defensive coordinator as well. LSU has lost four straight opening games. So they are trying to defeat that trend this season. And then from there, if they could get off, get off the Schneid and beat USC, it's a very favorable, favorable schedule moving forward until they see Ole Miss. Uh, and then from there, they got Texas A&M. The back half of their schedule is really where it gets going. It gets hot and heavy in that back half of the schedule with Texas A&M, Alabama, Florida, and then Oklahoma at the end of the year there. Uh, I think it's going to be a challenge with the new offense and a new defensive coordinator for them to legitimately be in the SEC championship game the dominoes have to fall in their favor as the season progresses, and we will see how things shake out in the back half of their schedule. That that back half of the schedule is a grind, and they're really on the outside looking in, but you can never count out LSU in the SEC. Uh, Brian Kelly is, gets these guys prepared every year. Next one, Texas A&M. This one was a tricky one for me because first-year head coach Mike Elko just like Kalen DeBoer. I'm not too high on the first-year head coaches, especially in the SEC. The difference is Mike Elko has SEC coaching experience, and he was has Texas A&M coaching experience, as he was the former defensive coordinator at Texas A&M before going to be the head coach at Duke. Anybody that has success at Duke as the head football coach and could build a program into a ACC championship game contender has a lot of respect in my book. Um, Texas A&M got hit very, very, very hard with the transfer transfer portal. They lost Walter Nolan to Ole Miss. They lost five-star wide receiver Evan Stewart to Oregon, Sco Ducks. Uh, they had so many players after Jimbo Fisher left that took off and went all over the country to other Power 5 schools. Uh, so what was Mike Elko's first order of business? Hit the transfer portal. So Mike Elko brought in Nick Scourton, uh, defensive tackle from Purdue. He was the Big Ten leader in sacks last year. Now he comes over to Texas A&M. That defensive line will be a strength at, uh, Big, at Big Ten. At SEC Media Days, Mike Elko – Already, well, I shouldn't say already, as a as a defensive coordinator and head coach, and now back at Texas AM with all of his years of coaching experience, he is saying that he thinks this is the best defense he's ever had in his entire coaching career. That's saying a lot. If that's the case, Texas AM is going to be in every single game that they play, whether they are on the right side or the wrong side of every game. If you have that good of a defense, the defense travels. Texas A&M will be a SEC championship game contender because of their defense. 
They lost a lot on offense. But if you could keep your team in games, ball goes your way, a couple good bounces one way or the other, you're talking one-score games here and there. Texas A&M could be a very surprising team. Opening up the schedule against Notre Dame, they get Notre Dame at home. That's going to be a challenge. But Mike Elko's familiar with Riley Leonard as that was his quarterback at Texas A&M. So he knows what Riley Leonard's going to bring to the table for Notre Dame. Uh, that's going to be, I think a lot of people are looking at that as a Notre Dame win. I would pump the brakes on that one there. Uh, this Texas A&M team is going to be a lot better than people think. Um, week three, they go to Florida. We'll talk about Florida in the second half of the show. That's going to be a challenge. First year head coach in the SEC, Mike Elko, like I said, he's got defensive coordinator experience in the SEC, but being the first year head coach going to the swamp, that's going to be, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, then you move down into the second half of their schedule. They get Missouri, but they get Missouri at tech at home. That could be a, a game that goes their way. Uh, LSU at home. Then you go further down the list. They got to go to Auburn at Jordan here, but then they get Texas at the end of the year at home. They also don't have Alabama on that schedule. You also don't see Ole Miss on that schedule. Um, Mike Elko in year one, I think will put together a winning season, eight and four, seven and five. Maybe if things go very, very favor favorably, nine and three. Um, going to be a surprise team in the SEC. I really think they will be a championship game contender. They're going to give every team on that schedule a headache, and that's why I put them in the contenders window. So that was my eight teams that I think are SEC title game contenders. Uh, my two personal favorite picks for the championship game, obviously Georgia, and I really like Ole Miss. But if you think any of those other eight teams – can't make it to the title game, you're crazy. All eight of these teams are very, very capable of making the SEC championship game. And they're all very capable of making the college football playoff, really. Because um, you you're going to see three, maybe four teams from the SEC make that college football playoff. Some SEC crazies will tell you that the SEC should get six out of the 12 teams. That's not possible. But that's what they think. Okay, moving on to everyone else. Okay, so... You got Oklahoma, Florida, Kentucky, Auburn, South Carolina, Arkansas, Mississippi State, and Vanderbilt. Okay, the four teams on the right, I think there's justifiable reason why they're in the everyone else category. They got no shot of making the championship game. You want to make an argument for Oklahoma, Florida, Kentucky, or Auburn as they should be SEC championship game contenders? Go for it. I'm here to hear you out. I just don't think they're in that that part of the half tier of the top tier of the sec, not this year, at least. Uh, but I would love to hear the case for why you think in Oklahoma, Florida, Kentucky, or Auburn are sec title game contenders. If you want to give me a good sales pitch, a crazy sales pitch about why Vanderbilt belongs as an sec championship game contender. I'm all ears. I want to hear it. I will say you're wrong, but I want to hear it. Okay. So, First order of business, new team to the SEC this year, the Oklahoma Sooners, Boomer Sooner. Um, they do have a lot of talent. They recruit well. I just don't see with their schedule in year one of the SEC, I I, I can't put them in the contender side. Sorry to my guy Shankster. Uh, I just, I mean, they've got Jackson Arnold. They've got some strength at wide receiver. The offensive line is going to be very helpful to uh, redshirt freshman Jackson Arnold. He's just not on that tier as far as quarterback play from redshirt freshman. There's Nico at Tennessee, and there's Jackson Arnold, both five-star quarterbacks who played in their team's bowl game last year to show how good they can be. Nico has been at Tennessee. He's played in the SEC. Jackson Arnold coming to the SEC from the Big 12 this year. It's going to be a little bit different. Um, the strength of this team with Brent Venables is always going to be the defense, and they can put together some really good offensive pieces to uh, be contenders. 
But if you just look at uh, their schedule here, I mean, first three games should be wins. Um, it, it, that two-lane game, though, man, that could be a sneaky pick for an early upset. I mean, you got to be careful. But then you got to play Tennessee. You get Tennessee at home. Uh, then you got to go to Auburn and then to Texas. Well, the Texas, I'm sorry, is a neutral site game. They beat Texas last year. They're very familiar. That's a big rivalry game. Uh, but what you got to look at here is not the first half of their schedule because what you're seeing there is let's say they beat Texas again for the second year in a row with a loss to Tennessee. Okay, so let's say they beat Auburn. So now they are three, four, five, and one going to South Carolina. That's six and one. But now you really get to the meat and potatoes of the schedule. Now you got to go to Ole Miss. Then you got to play in November. You got to go to Mizzou in November. Then you got to play Alabama. And then you have to end your season with LSU. This is one of the toughest schedules in the country. Um, And I can't, with them being a new team in the SEC, really consider them an SEC title game contender. Not this year, at least. I think they're going to learn a lot about SEC play this year uh, and how to handle the schedule and how to handle the travel and what they need to do moving forward. They'll be a six to seven win team. I mean, you look at Tennessee, Houston, Tulane, those should be wins. Um, I would call Auburn a win. So that's four wins there. South Carolina is a fifth win and Maine is a sixth win. The rest of the schedule in there, I find I can only see another one, maybe, maybe two wins in there. But I feel like they're just going to have a little bit of a struggle. Jackson Arnold, uh, there's going to be brighter days ahead for Jackson Arnold than this offense. The defense is a very strong uh, returning group. Uh, but SEC, there's no days off in the SEC. Speaking of challenging schedules, um. The Gators. So the biggest storylines about the Gators this year is year three under Billy Napier. They underperformed last year. They had a lot of close losses, meaning like a one score game where they were in it and could have won and they things just didn't go their way. Things have to go their way this year. And I think they're due for an upswing here. Um, Still the most difficult schedule in the country by far. Um, But I think they're going to surprise some people here. Like people are already saying that this could be a make or break year for Billy Napier in year three. I personally don't think that's uh, fair because year three is still in the college game. You're still working through some things at SEC media day. Billy Napier, when asked about his job and the progression of the program. He said, we're right on track. We are right on schedule. Do the donors agree with that? Does the athletic director agree with that? That will still be seen later on. Uh, But I really think year two with Graham Mertz under Billy Napier, and then they got a true freshman who hopefully doesn't see a lot of time. But if Graham Mertz struggles, you've got DJ Lagway right there behind him, uh, ready to go. Uh, But just looking at the schedule, man, Miami, Texas A&M, UCF is going to be a tough one, Uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida State. They are going through the gauntlet. I think it's going to be a better team than people expect. Like, I think they're going to give Miami a good run for their money. Miami will be favored in that game, but rival rivalry game could go Florida's way. Texas A&M, like we said, Texas A&M's defense is going to keep a minute. How is Florida's offense going to respond to that year one under a, under uh, Mike Elko for Texas A&M, is Billy Napier and that offense going to be prepared? Uh, Tennessee 
at night at Neyland Stadium. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> that that one sorry, Gators. That one's not happening. Uh, but Kentucky's a winnable game. Georgia, no. Texas, we'll see what kind of Texas we have that late in the season in year one of the SEC. I'm not going to rule that game out as a loss for the Gators. They won't be favored, but they could surprise some people. LSU, Ole Miss, and then the rivalry game against Florida State. The win total over under that Vegas has set for this team is five and a half. I see seven wins here. I really do. I think, I think Billy Napier gets the team back on track, like he was saying. And I think the offense starts to click. And I think a lot of these games that were one loss games for them this year, that just didn't go their way. They're going to finish the games and they're going to find the ways to win this year after a tough year where they found a ways to, to lose essentially. So Don't sleep on this Florida team. They are going to give the SEC championship game contenders fits. So like Texas A&M, Texas, LSU, and Ole Miss, they got to be careful. I don't think they got a shot at Neyland Stadium against Tennessee. I don't think they have a shot against Georgia. But don't tell me that they can't win against Miami, against Texas A&M, against Kentucky, against Texas, against LSU, against Ole Miss, and then the rivalry game against Florida State. We'll dig into Florida State during the ACC preview, but man, to say that they're going to be another team, a five-win team and miss a bowl game, I mean, they're better than Mississippi State. I think they're better than Kentucky. Kentucky's had their number in years past, but... They're due for a winning season and going to a bowl game. I really like this Florida Gator team. I think people are writing them off too easily. So keep an eye on the Florida Gators. Take the over on the win total. Next, Kentucky. Mark Stoops. (laughs) Remember when Mark Stoops was the next head coach at Texas A&M? And then... In the 11th hour, he was like, oh, just kidding. I never took that job. I don't know where that rumor came from. I'm going to be at Kentucky. I'm going to stay at Kentucky because I'm a, this is my program. This is year 12 for me in my program. I don't know. Is he waiting for Kirk Ferentz to retire and go back to Iowa to be the next head coach at Iowa and be in the Big Ten and be in a very good position there? Who knows? Seemed like a very, very easy decision to leave Kentucky to go to Texas A&M and take that job and take the pay raise. He opted to stay at Kentucky. Um, They bring in quarterback Blake Vandegrift, former four-star or five-star recruit uh, that was a Georgia signee who transfers in from Georgia. Kentucky seems to be playing the quarterback carousel through the years. This is their third or fourth quarterback in four years. Sometimes when you don't get the guys behind you on the depth chart, that's what you have to do. You got to hit the transfer portal. Uh, Which kind of quarterback are we going to see from Blake Vandegrift under Mark Stoops is yet to be seen. Uh, The offensive line will give Blake Vandegrift a lot of protection. Things that's going to be a struggle for Kentucky. Again, you look at this schedule. Okay. Looks like they should start out 2-0, but then they they go – SEC opener against Georgia. Sorry, that's a loss. Going up against Ohio Bobcats, whatever. Then you got Ole Miss, you got Florida, you got Auburn, you got Tennessee, you got Texas, and then you got the rivalry game against Louisville. Louisville should be an ACC championship game contender from all the looks of things with what they return and what they have as far as the ACC goes. Um, Bowl game contender, but nothing more than that from this team here. Uh, I think they're not going to give teams fits like Florida. They're just a little bit further down my rankings for the SEC. Uh, Auburn, year two under Hugh Freeze. I really don't know what to expect from this team. They're always in the mix to pull off an upset. I think Hugh Freeze did a very good job in year one. 
with the exception of they lost to New Mexico at home and kind of got caught looking ahead to Alabama. They can't look ahead to Alabama this year. Look at the back half of that schedule. They have to face Texas A&M the week before Alabama. <laughs> um, sneaky team because of the fact that Q Freeze is always prepared. His teams are always prepared. He's been known to build programs and develop winning teams. I think Auburn is still one to two years away, though, from being back in that SEC title game contention discussion. Um, challenging schedule. They got to face Mizzou. They have to face Arkansas. I'm sorry, not Arkansas, Georgia, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, Alabama. Uh, the offense should be improved. Kentucky may be a game that they could win, but that's going to be on the road at Kentucky. Uh, 500 team, be a successful year for Hugh Freeze if they make it to a bowl game and then win their bowl game and then continue to recruit and develop uh, to what he has envisioned. Next up, South Carolina. A lot of people are down on South Carolina. I'm included in that group. But if you're going to watch South Carolina football this year, key in on this dude on the screen right here. That's uh, Nick Harbor, uh, wide receiver for South Carolina. He was a tight end recruit out of high school. Uh, he has speed. The dude can run. The dude can catch. I think in uh, college football 25, he has the fastest rating for speed. He's one of the few guys that has a 99 for speed rating in college football 25, and it's legitimate. Uh, you watch South Carolina football this year. You're tuning in for Nick Harbor. Uh, there's not too much else there for South Carolina. They have a challenging schedule. Uh, every game could be a loss. <laughs> I mean, outside of you know playing Old Dominion and Akron, and then Wofford. I mean, you got three wins there. They face Vanderbilt. I think Vanderbilt's going to be an improved team. That's a fourth win, but I don't know. Shane Beamer and Beamer Ball. This could be a make or break year for Shane Beamer. If if they have a four or five win season, he may. Uh, he may be eating a pink slip this year, uh, but they have Nick Harbor, who is a stud, and he's going to be a first-round NFL draft pick. I believe he's got another year of eligibility before he can turn pro, uh, so that'll be exciting to see. Maybe he enters a transfer portal if they have a new coach next year, but man, I don't see, I don't see how they win games with this schedule, other than some of these layup wins. So. Watch South Carolina football to watch Nick Harbor. That's about all there is there. <laughs> Arkansas Razorbacks. This is head coach Sam Pittman. He is a longtime veteran of college football coaching. He was the former offensive line coach at Georgia, then got hired at Arkansas. This is year five under Sam Pittman. Always a good interview. Very good quotes. He's not up at a Lane Kippen style of quotes, but at SEC Media Day, his opening remark to the media was that this year, the Arkansas football team needed to embrace the hog. So anytime I see Sam Pittman now, and I think of the 2024 Arkansas Razorbacks, I'm thinking embrace the hog is the message. Embrace the hog. You can get that shirt. They have shirts, I believe. I don't know where not giving out any free ads. Uh, but, man, if they don't win this year, if they don't improve on their win total, this could be it for Sam Pittman. He might be going back to being a offensive line coach at a Power 5 program, which would be a gain for whoever gets him. But, I mean, Oklahoma State, at Oklahoma State, at Auburn, Texas A&M, Tennessee, LSU, Ole Miss, Texas, <laughs> Mizzou. This is a Florida style of schedule without the amount of talent that Florida has. Now, a little uh, plot twist here. Bobby Petrino, Petrino returns to Arkansas, where he was a former head coach and had a big scandal back in the day. Uh, now he is the offensive coordinator. This kind of feels like a Hail Mary play for Sam Pittman to get the offense back on track. Uh, the defense will be a strength on the D-line. And it's been shown that Sam Pittman can 
develop offensive line play. They brought in Talon Green from Boise State to be their starting quarterback this year. That was a Bobby Petrino hand-picked transfer in the portal. I just don't see this team doing a whole lot. This could be it for Sam Pittman, which is sad because I love the embrace the hog quote. He also had a quote about when asked if Arkansas fans hate Texas more than they love Arkansas as far as fandom for uh, SEC football. He asked that. He goes, yeah, you're probably correct. (laughs) He just, he didn't lay it out there, defend the fans. He just said, yeah, you're right. Our fans hate Texas more than they love Arkansas. And last but not least, oh, I'm sorry. No, we got two more. Mississippi State, year one under Jeff Levy. I love the tradition of a Mississippi State uh, football game with the cowbells. That's why I put this fan right up in front and center with the cowbells there. Um, But year one under Jeff Levy, holy cow, he's got a lot of work to do. He's got his work cut out for him. Uh, They had so many people transfer out with the firing of their previous head coach who uh, changed the style of Mississippi state football, Mississippi state under Mike Leach was air raid offense, air raid offense. They went away from that last year and it cost uh, Zach Arnett, their previous head coach, his job. They brought in Jeff Levy. They hope to get back to a high powered offense and air raid offense. Uh, they brought in Blake Shapin from Baylor to transfer in. Uh, they're very high on Blake as their quarterback, but there's really – it's a boneyard there. It's going to be a long year for Mississippi State. We'll see how things pan out down the road in year three, year four, year five, if um, Jeff Levy can make it that far. I think they he, they made a good hire. It's the right fit for Mississippi State with the culture and the tradition of the air raid offense, but he's going to have to win in the SEC. So he's got his work cut out for him here with that. And last but not least, Vanderbilt. Uh, The cellar dwellers, if you will, of the SEC traditionally, not a high-powered football program outside of developing Jay Cutler and Earl Bennett back in the day. Uh, James Franklin had some success here at Vanderbilt before going to Penn State. Um, But they are under year year four now under Clark Leah as the head coach. Uh, Clark Leah is a Vanderbilt alumni, played at Vanderbilt. Some people are saying he's on the hot seat. Why? You, you think Vanderbilt's really concerned about winning football games? I don't think football is a priority at Vanderbilt over the academics. I mean, they have success in other athletic programs, especially in baseball. Um, That being said, I do think they will outperform expectations. I think their win total is two and a half. I think they'll find a way to get three wins this year. I mean, come on. They had some, uh, two years ago, they had two upsets in SEC play. They beat Florida. They beat Kentucky. Last year, they kind of went backwards a little bit. But they bring in uh, New Mexico State transfer, Diego Pavia, to play quarterback. Um, fun, entertaining guy to watch at the quarterback position. I will tune in just to watch him play quarterback. I'll watch Vanderbilt football just to watch him. Um, tough schedule though. I mean, non-conference, they got Virginia tech scheduled as the opener in week one, uh, Mizzou, Alabama, Kentucky, Texas, LSU, Tennessee, Tennessee with the rivalry game. Uh, they brought in Diego Pavia. And the reason why they brought him in is because new offensive coordinator Tim Beck was his offensive coordinator at New Mexico State. And here's a little wild card, little tidbit for those of you that don't know what else Vanderbilt football has this year. Uh, Former New Mexico State head coach and head coaching legend Jerry Kill, former SIU and NIU head coach, uh, has had success and won everywhere he's gone as far as um, being a coach. He's not the head coach. He's not even a position coach, but he is a offensive analyst for Vanderbilt. He will have some input to 
Vanderbilt's offense. He will have some input into how things are run at Vanderbilt. Clark Lee is definitely going to look to him as a mentor, and I think that really moves the needle the right direction for Vanderbilt football this year. They can win four games. I don't think they can win more than four. But, I mean, come on. There's no expectations here. There's no pressure for Vanderbilt. Just every game you're playing with house money. I mean, you're not going to lose to Alcorn State. You know, I mean, they're going to find a way to, to get to that three to four win mark, over two and a half wins. Okay, so that will do it for the first episode of season two of the Grateful Ducks podcast. Uh, next episode, later down the road this week, I will preview the new Big Ten. We'll be Oregon Duck heavy in that episode. We will be Ohio State heavy in that episode. Uh, I'll probably break it down into a few more tiers as there's 18 teams instead of 16. Uh, and we will see you all in just a couple days. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Bruhan Luke. Make sure to follow Grateful Ducks on Twitter at GR8FUL Ducks CFB on Twitter. Um, also, a big thank you to. Uh, Sadistic Penguin Studio Coordinator Lil Yumper for the new intro. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that as well. Uh, this has been Bruhan Luke with the Grateful Ducks. We will see you very soon. Bye.